Hey everybody, thanks for joining White Dog Outdoors and our series on urine and fang for steelhead. This is going to be a multi-part series and as with all of my series, you guys already know that I go into a lot of detail, but that I do it in an easily digestible way so that I can help as many people as possible. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna give you an overview of all the topics I'm gonna cover in this series and I want you to tell me if there's anything that I'm missing. I want this to be as comprehensive as possible. So please leave comments down below and things you wanna see in subsequent volumes of this series. So here's what we're gonna cover in this series. We're gonna start off with safety. Um, from a safety perspective, but also from a, hey, I've done these things wrong and they've ruined my trip or they've ruined my day. Try to save you guys from ruining your days uh, by the mistakes that I've made. We're gonna learn about steelhead behavior. So the seasonal patterns, the migrations that they make, um, how you target them in the different seasons, how you target them in different types of water to be able to be successful. We're gonna dive into gear and how the gear has evolved over time and how I've evolved with it over time. So I'm gonna go through my evolution of the gear that I've used, what's been good, what's been bad, and how we finally have on the market tools that are really optimized to giving you an absolute perfect performance for urine and thing for steelhead. We're gonna get into leader setups, whether that is a, whether you require a fly line for the water that you fish, and I do for a lot of those, or whether you can get away with a mono rig. We're gonna go through how I set up for all those different types of situations. We're gonna get into flies and what types of flies I like for different types of water and how I can tie my flies to be effective for a lot of different situations. All right, we're gonna talk about reading water and how crucial reading water is to being able to be successful and how Reading water really takes the average fisherman and makes them an exceptional fisherman. You can go out and find fish that nobody else can find because you can read the water and know where they're gonna be. We are gonna talk about fighting and landing fish. And Salmon and Steelhead will teach you so much about fighting and landing fish because there's no room for error. They are gonna push your limits and you need to learn to control that to put yourself in the best situation possible of fighting and landing those fish. And we're gonna talk about that from a perspective of doing it on your own because a lot of people go on their own and I do. Or if you've got a net man and you don't wanna be the net man that screws it up for your buddy. We are gonna talk about handling fish and how important it is to preserving the fishery to be able to fight and land those fish effectively, keeping them safe while they're in your care and getting them released nice and strong so they can go make the next generation of steelhead. And inevitably, when you're steelhead fishing, these fish are absolutely crazy. They're so much fun to catch, which means everybody wants to go catch them, right? So you're gonna deal with other people on the river and you might deal with a lot of people on the river. So dealing with those types of situations, being able to find unpressured fish and being able to put yourself in the situation where you're gonna be able to be successful, whether you're in a crowd or whether you're, whoa, holy. Oh my God, is that a bald eagle? <laughs> okay, a bald eagle just tried to take out a freaking heron. That was ridiculous. Okay, wow, that was, that was nuts. Okay, let's start that one over. Uh, and a topic that other people have brought up to me that they wanted me to cover was etiquette. And I think steelhead is probably the perfect time to cover that because there are a lot of people and you're gonna be dealing with other people. So stream etiquette, we're gonna go through some situations that I've been through and kind of how to handle those situations. So that's what we plan to cover in this series. Let me know down below in the comments what other information you want me to be able to cover for you and we will do our best to make this a very comprehensive series on urine and thing for steelhead. One thing I'm not gonna cover in this series is how to urine imp. Um, I'm going to assume that you already have the basics. If you are new to urine nymphing, if you don't know how to urine nymph, or if you feel like you really want to improve your game before challenging yourself on steelhead, I have a full series on how to urine nymph. I'm going to put that up right here. I'm going to pop it up here. I'm going to leave it down in the description below. It is a five-part series on the basics, and then there are other videos on advanced techniques, including reading water. And I think urine nymphing is the perfect application for a lot of steelhead situations. And back in the day when I was learning how to steelhead fish, I had no idea what urine nymphing was. I don't think it really existed as a term. Um, but a lot of the things that I did laid the groundwork for that tight line nymphing. You know, I'd find myself in pressured situations. I had to go find other water. And I started searching water that other people were just skipping. And by learning how to read that water and learning how to get my flies in the right places, essentially urine nymphing, um, I found that I was able to be successful in situations where other people weren't. So I think 
that steelhead is the perfect place for your nymphing. I think it's going to drastically improve your game, and that's my goal. I want you guys to be able to go out there in a lot of different situations and be successful. So, we have a lot to cover, and I'm excited to get you guys hooked up on some steelhead, so let's get started. So let's start with safety. And I want to take this from a safety perspective, making sure that you stay safe. But I also want to take it from a, I don't want you to ruin your day or your trip kind of perspective. And I have done those things. I have ruined my day. I have ruined my trip because I wasn't prepared. So the number one thing about steelhead fishing is that you're going to be doing it in cold water conditions and in cold weather conditions. Typically, you know, the best steelhead fishing where I live is November to April, right? And so you're gonna be dealing with cold water, you're gonna be dealing with cold weather, it's, it might be snowing, it might be sleeting, raining, all sorts of stuff. Make sure you are prepared. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring multiple changes of clothes. I don't wanna fall in the river, soak my waders in 40 degree water, and at that point, I would have to be done for the day. But if I bring extra clothing and I bring extra waders, I can go back to the car, I can dry off, and I can put a whole new set of stuff on, I can warm up, and I'm back to fishing. And I have done this. Uh, on two different instances, I fell in the water in probably in November and April, and my, my trip was ruined. It was way too cold, and I ruined my trip. Um, from that point on, I always brought extra clothes, and I always brought extra waders. If it's going to be raining, if it's going to be snowing, make sure you have a layer over top that is going to be windproof, waterproof, um, protect you from those elements. It will be cold in a lot of situations when you're steelheading. So make sure that you have plenty of layers and plenty of options to be able to keep you warm. You know, on the border months of November and like April, you might be able to get away with lightweight, breathable waders um, by layering underneath appropriately to keep yourself warm. The biggest thing that I would caution is you don't want your boots to be too tight. You need to allow the blood to circulate through your feet in order to keep your feet warm. And in the winter when it's, you know, I've been up to uh, Pulaski or Altmar in 15 degree weather, the water's, you know, in the low, low to mid 30s and I had the wrong boots on and I stepped into the water and within 15 minutes my feet were ice. That was a pretty bad trip. We did not have a good time. <laughs> um, couldn't last very long. Um, just did not have the right boots. The boots were too tight on my feet. So the colder it gets, the more you wanna make sure that your boots are just a little bit loose and that you can have circulation going through your feet. You gotta keep your core warm and you gotta keep your feet warm. Do not have boots that are too tight and make sure that you have plenty of layers to keep your, the rest of your body warm. I would suggest when it gets to be the dead of winter and you're really dealing with cold conditions, I would go to neoprene waders, thick neoprene waders with built-in boots. Those built-in boots are bigger. They're gonna allow you more room in them to stay warm. Um, I have gone to those types of situations where I'll have neoprene waders with built-in boots. Amazing the difference of how much warmer they are. You don't have as good agility, probably, when you're walking around with those heavier waders and those bigger boots, but just take your time, be careful. You will be a lot warmer with neoprene waders and built-in boots in the dead of winter. If you are gonna use breathable waders in the dead of winter, make sure you have lots of layers underneath. I have a fleece wading suit that I wear, and I'll wear multiple layers. I'll wear long johns, I'll wear my fleece wading suit, I might wear something over those, and then my waders. Make sure I have nice warm socks, and make sure that my boots are not too tight. You know, in the dead of winter, I would probably suggest that you bring a wading staff. I know a lot of people don't like them. I don't use them in a lot of situations, but I will use them in the dead of winter because that third point of stability it might just keep me from going into the water when it's really, really cold, right? So I would bring it. If you feel like the waiting is a little tricky, make sure you have that waiting staff with you. I would also be very cautious of crossing rivers. This is something that I do all the time. I need to get to that side of the river to be able to fish the run the way that I want. Then I need to get to this side of the river to be able to fish this one. I do tend to cross rivers a lot. I would urge caution in that. Number one, um, if you're doing it by yourself, absolutely make sure you have that wading staff. I don't cross a river, um, especially in colder water, without having that wading staff and feeling like I have a safe place where I can cross. Um, if you have multiple people, there's great ways of crossing together, right? So what you do is you lock your arms and you keep each other really tight. You've got a line of people that are with the current. So you get the first person is breaking the current, 
the person behind them is in their in the eddy behind them so they don't have that much current against them and then you stack the people down you know downstream and you keep your arms tight you only have one person move at a time right starting with the lead person the person who's breaking water has a waiting staff on the upstream side they plant their staff they take one step bring their other foot in and they get themselves stable and when they're stable they tell the person next to them that they can go and that person makes a step forward and it goes on down the line do not rush it i've seen people try to do it and they go too fast and what they do is they take the line down with them one person moving at a time you wait till that person's stable the next person goes and don't let your arms be floppy because you're worried about holding on to the guy next to you i've crossed with some really experienced guides hold them tight tight like this keep that person really tight to you you're going to be so much more stable that way if somebody starts to slip, somebody starts to lose it, they've got people on either side holding them tight and they're not gonna fall. There are various ways of fly fishing for steelhead. I don't want you to think that urine and fang is the only thing that you can do to catch steelhead on a fly rod. It is not, um, by far. I have found it to be incredibly effective in a lot of situations, but there are other situations where other methods work really well. And so in my years of, of steelhead fishing and fly fishing for steelhead, here's what I see. I see basically three different types of fishing. There's, there's drifting uh, without a float. So some sort of nymphing where you're subsurface and you don't have any kind of indicator um, on the surface of the water um, to be able to, to know that you have a strike. Then there's drifting with an indicator or a, or a float. And basically what you're doing is you're waiting for that float to pause, bop, or go under. Um, and I did that for many years. Um, so there are a lot of situations where that works really well. Or what you would see is maybe on some bigger water, some more open stretches where you have more room, you'll see people using longer rods and they are swinging. So they're doing like spay or modified spay casts. They're casting across and they're letting that, that fly swing down through the current and they're waiting for a tug on the other end. So for fly rods, I think those are typically the, the three methods that I see. Um, we're gonna go into a little more depth with each of them here. Okay, urine and thing I think is good for a lot of different situations. Not good for every situation. Um, for most of the water that I fish, I'm pretty much a urine and thing most of the time. Urine and thing does tend to be close quarters fishing. So you have less reach when you're urine and thing, but you have a lot more control. So if I'm able to fish close to me, if I need to fish fast water, um, if I need to get down deep in an area and I think that anything the surface is going to just be pushing too fast, that's perfect for urine and thing. I'm going to try to get my flies down deep below that fast water into the slow water and I'm going to try to find my fish there. I find that most of my urine and thing or most of my steelhead fishing is perfect like that for urine and thing. If I have slower, deeper pools, um, Urine nymphing probably is not the best situation for that. I would go to something more like maybe an indicator nymph where I can cast a further distance with an indicator, right? I don't need to keep a tight line. I've got a visual. I'm watching that float go down the river. So it helps me reach things that I couldn't reach while urine nymphing. It helps me with maybe some slower pools where my flies would just sink to the bottom and snag on the bottom, where now I have them suspended on a float and I can, I can get a, a nice long drift throughout a nice long pool um, that way. So an indicator could be really good for that. Um, there's a lot of situations where I've, I've gone back to the year indicator um, to be able to fish because I just simply couldn't reach or couldn't do what I wanted to with a urine and thing rod. And then there are situations in which I might want to swing a fly. And this is not primarily what I'm going to do, but there is a whole breed of people out there that absolutely love swinging for salmon and steelhead. And I can see it. Like, it looks like a lot of fun. There's a lot of casting involved, using spay and modified spay cast to be able to whip long lines and flies, and you're letting your fly swing down through and you're waiting for that tug. And it's pretty cool to be able to do that. I find most of my waters aren't suitable to that. Too many people, um, I don't have the runs for it, or the runs that I do have, I don't want to sit there and do that all day. I'm more of an explorer. I want to go find fish, and that's where urine and thing really comes in handy for me. But look at the water that you have in front of you. Figure out which technique might be the best for you, and be open to the fact that maybe one technique is not everything. You know, this video is about urine and thing, so I'm going to leave those other techniques there for now, but realize that they do exist. Explore them and when you have the right types of situations.
right, let's talk about a big one, and that is steelhead behavior. We are going to need to understand how these fish are gonna move, where they're gonna be, how they're gonna behave in different types of situations, understanding the seasons, understanding different types of water. We're gonna get into depth on some of that a little bit further, but I want you to understand the basics here, right? Steelhead are a migratory fish. They are gonna come from a large body of water, whether that's the ocean or a monstrous lake or even a smaller lake. And they're going to head up into those rivers at certain times to engage in certain activities. The big activities that they're gonna engage in are spawning, or they might be chasing other fish into the rivers as a food source, okay? So, one thing I wanna say first is that I live in the Northeast. I fish Great Lakes tributaries. So the time frames that I talk about here in this video series might be different for you depending on where you fish. If you're the West Coast, it might be a little bit different. If you're up in Alaska, it's probably very different. Um, or if you're any, any, somewhere else in the world, it could be very different. So, you know, the, the, the time frames I'm talking about here are really specific to uh, my experiences in the Great Lakes. The earliest that I see steelhead moving into the rivers that I've personally experienced it was in very, very late September. I connected while salmon fishing, I connected with a steelhead. They're gonna be pretty rare in those types of situations. You're not gonna find that many of them. Um, in October, mid to late October, you'll start to see them appear a little bit more, usually in the beginning of November, really where I feel like we start to get our first good pushes of steelhead into the river. And those early steelhead, they're not coming into spawn yet. They're coming in and chasing, they're chasing food, really. Um, those, those, uh, they have salmon runs and there's a lot of eggs that are being dropped, a lot of you know, sam dead salmon floating down. There's a lot of food in the rivers at that particular time for steelhead and they come and they follow those salmon in. So I would say usually in November, you start to get your first good push of steelhead into the river systems. They can stay in the river systems all winter long, okay? Um, you'll find that they move into the river systems all throughout the winter. Um, and, you know, you just wanna, you wanna keep an eye on different information resources to understand what the movements are. If you're not on the river, if you're not seeing it, start to look at local fly shops, different places like that, where you can track how the fish movement is happening so that when you do make a trip, you're not gonna go to the lower river when there's no fish coming in, when oh, there's a ton of fish in the upper river. If you have that information, it's gonna help you plan and be effective, okay? So the fish, they come in in the fall, they can stay all winter, they can come in all winter long, and then you'll get another push in the spring, late winter, early spring. Um, they are gonna start spawning activities typically around maybe the beginning, middle of March, and then when you get in the middle, end of March and early April, a lot of those spawning activities are in high mode. By the time you get to the middle of April, maybe the end of April, they're pretty much wrapping up. Um, and then you're, they're gonna be what they call drop back sam or steelhead. So they've already spawned, they're a lot skinnier, but they are hungry after all the activity that they've done. And they're gonna slowly make their way back to the lake or the ocean that they came from. And it could potentially be really, really good fishing. So that can happen, you know, March, April, um, I've had some of my best steelhead fishing in April. Once you get to May, you know, you're gonna have fewer fish. Middle of May, you're, 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 most of the fish are probably gonna be back in the, in the, in the bigger waters by then. Um, I think if you can, you know, coordinate your trip around expected timeframes um, and then follow the information that's there um, available for you at the time, you know, should we be going to the middle of the river? Should we be going to the upper river? Um, are there fresh fish coming in? Should we go to the lower river? Those kinds of things will help you able to be successful. All right, we are gonna talk about gear, but before we do, I just wanna take a quick pause and say thank you. Thank you if you're somebody who watches our videos. Thank you if you are a subscriber and you watch our videos regularly, and especially to our pack members, Thank you. The pack is essentially a membership where I provide exclusive content. We're gonna be starting live streams this fall to help do some question and answer for members. So however you choose to support the channel, it supports the work that we do and I really appreciate it. So thank you and let's get talking about gear. I have been steelhead fishing for many years and I would say that I have evolved as a fisherman and the gear has also evolved over those many years and so I think a lot of people are probably in that same timeline um, of that evolution, somewhere along that same timeline. And so I wanted to go through where I started, the experiences I had with different types of gear and really where I've ended up to find that, what I believe is a perfect setup for the type of steelhead fishing that I do. 
So when I first started off, I didn't have a lot of money. I had to go with the gear that I already had. I had a nine foot nine weight that I used for salmon fishing. And I said, well, it's close enough to steelhead. I'm gonna go ahead and use it for steelhead. I don't have the money to go buy a new rod. And I will tell you that on bigger waters where I could get away with heavier leaders, it worked. And I caught my share. I caught plenty of steelhead on the nine foot nine weight. Um, that rod, you know, it's a little bit heavier. It's very stiff um, and it wasn't very forgiving. So. I learned this when I got off the bigger water and I got into some smaller Erie tribs where I couldn't get away with that heavy line. I really had to downsize my line. And what ended up happening was I could get the bites, but I couldn't land the fish. And I was out with a group of about four guys and I was the only one that couldn't land a fish. They were all landing their fish. I was getting just as many bites, but I was breaking my tippet. And it was because this nine weight just did not have a supple tip and it was not allowing me to fight those fish on lighter line. So I learned very quickly that in a lot of situations, that nine foot nine weight, it just didn't do what I needed it to do. So I would say if a nine foot nine weight is all you have, maybe you've been salmon fishing and you don't have money to spend on another rod, don't keep yourself from fishing just because you don't have a softer rod. You know, still go with a nine foot nine weight. It'll get you out there, it'll get you experience, but I think you'll find it does have limitations. I went from the nine foot nine weight to a slightly softer rod and it still it was a nine foot rod so this is a nine foot seven weight, nine foot eight weight. I think it's a seven eight. Um, and it allowed me to fish some of that softer, slower water or smaller water and be effective where I wasn't breaking off anywhere near as many fish. And so it certainly had its place in my arsenal. What I started to discover was that the more I became a better fisherman, the more I wanted the tight line nymph. And I didn't know it was urine nymphing at that point, but I wanted the tight line nymph. And that meant that I needed reach to be able to reach the places that I wanted to go. So, you know, my days of throwing an indicator kind of were gone at that point. I, I discovered that the better I got, the more I wanted to get away and the more I wanted to find fish in areas where other people weren't. And my ability to tight line nymph with a nine foot rod became a limiting factor. And so at that time, this was when the evolution of the switch rod came out. So I moved to a switch rod. I went out and bought a switch rod. I was so excited to get my switch rod. A switch rod essentially is a two-handed rod that is much longer. So this, is a, this here is an 11 foot three inch switch rod. It's a Reddington uh, CPX. This rod really allowed me to be able to reach fish that I couldn't reach otherwise. So that nine foot was really limiting. The switch rod made it, made, put me in situations where I could be successful where I couldn't be before. That extra length, really helped me reach fish. The softer tip uh, really allowed me to be able to fight fish and the backbone allowed me to be able to fight those fish as well. But this is not a urine nymphing specific rod. And so I found that it's really good for being versatile. So I could go out and I could nymph. I could go out and I could really roll cast an indicator really far and it would help me cover a lot of water. I could go out and I could cast and swing streamers really, really far. The more I focused on that nymphing style, um, the more I realized that this wasn't a good rod for me. It was way too heavy and it wasn't very sensitive. And, you know, I really, it left me feeling like I, like there wasn't a rod on the market that was going to do what I wanted to do. And the more I got into urine nymphing and the more I learned using those urine nymphing specific rods, the more I realized that I was really missing it on the heavier end for steelhead. So after years of using a, a switch rod that was too heavy and I was really couldn't find, there was no rod that existed that would allow me to do what I wanted to do. I, I couldn't, I didn't have a rod that I could Euronymph really for steelhead. And then after many years, I started to hear about the Diamondbacks rods um, and that there was an ideal nymph six weight. And when I looked into this, I said, oh my God, finally somebody has made the rod that I have been looking for for years. I immediately went out got a six weight, a Diamondback Ideal Nymph six weight, and I took it out on the Ritter, river, and it was, it was honestly everything that I had hoped to dream for. I don't wanna seem, seem like I'm gushing over here, but it literally was everything that I was looking for. Um, I went out on the water and I found, number one, the backbone on this thing is incredible. The lightness on this thing, the weight, this thing weighs a little over 10 and a half ounces, fully outfitted, whereas my switch rod was almost a pound, right? The feeling in my hand is ridiculously light. This thing feels like I'm, I'm not even holding a rod, right? 
the backbone in it was phenomenal. I've learned that a few times when I've gotten into fish and I've, I've gotten into situations where I was like, they are gonna bury me in a tree and if I don't pull wicked hard, I'm not getting this fish out. And I literally could not believe what this rod did. It's got incredible backbone, but it's got a great tip. It's got a soft tip. It protected my tippet like no other rod I've ever seen. And it's incredibly sensitive. And that is super, super important when you're steelhead fishing under pressured fish and tough conditions, cold waters, you know, it's just like you're nymphing. If I can't see or feel what's going on, then I don't know that I've got a fish and I'm gonna miss them, right? And that's exactly the way it is with steelhead a lot of times too. If I can't feel the subtleness of that small take, I am gonna miss fish. This rod is incredibly sensitive and I can feel what's going on so well. What really sold me on this rod is I had taken it to a small stream and I had, this stream was had nice little, a lot of nice deep pockets, but it was littered with trees. And I hooked into this really big steelhead. It was a 33, 33 inch fat female that was fresh, hadn't been in the river very long. And I hooked into this fish and she goes absolutely nuts in a small stream that is littered with trees. And she runs in and she tries to bury me in these trees. And I'm literally, my line is wrapped around a tree. I've got, I think, eight or 10 pound line on, I don't even remember. Um, and I basically said, well, I'm gonna lose this fish of a lifetime if I don't put a ton of pressure on her. And I just leaned into the rod and I literally pulled her out uh, through the trees and everything. I pulled her out and I was blown away by what this rod did. I guarantee you on any of the other rods that I have used in my life for steelhead, none of them would ever have landed that fish. And I was so excited that I recorded this little clip just after I landed that fish. There is no way I should have been able to land that fish. Most insane fight of my life, no doubt. He had me wrapped on that tree like twice, was way back in there a couple times, and I freaking leaned into the Diamondback and just pulled him out like four times. I don't know how I landed that fish, but holy crap. Most insane fight of my life. What an awesome steelhead. There's no way I would have been able to land that with any other setup that I've used in the past. This Diamondback absolutely blows me away. That was one of the biggest steelhead I've ever caught in one of the toughest places. And I can't believe that I just landed that fish. This Diamondback is a freaking stud. So one thing I would say is this rod is very specifically designed for urinimphing. So it's, it's meant to be like a mono rig or a urinimphing fly line kind of rod. It does not have the heavy tip of like a switch rod to be able to throw an indicator a long distance. Now, I, you know, I'm not gonna loop cast an indicator. I can still throw an indicator. I got plenty of backbone to throw it if I can back cast, but it's not gonna be one that I'm gonna do a lot of like spay casting with and roll casting to get an indicator out. And I'm not gonna swing much with it the same way. It's not meant to throw a heavy line. If you try to throw a heavy line on this, it's not gonna do what you want it to do. I would say the switch rod is your better place if you wanna be able to you know, roll cast an indicator or you wanna be able to swing some flies. So I would say, if you wanna go steelhead fishing, understand you know, what kind of fisherman you might be. If you are a urinimpher and you wanna be able to urinimp for steelhead, this Diamondback six weight is the ideal rod. It's the ideal nymph rod, right? Um, it literally is everything that I want it to be. If you are somebody who maybe you're not gonna be specifically focused on nymphing and you want to be able to do some other techniques, you want to roll cast some indicators, you want to do some swinging, maybe you look at some switch rods. Um, but you know, this, this video is really about urine nymphing and urine nymphing for steelhead. And I have found I am by far the most successful when I do that. And so, you know, this Diamondback six weight is really everything that I wanted it to be. All right, well, I became such a fan of the Diamondback fly rods that I had to contact Joe Goodspeed and say, I would love to work together when we hit our next big giveaway. And he said, dude, I'm in. So when we hit 25,000 subscribers, we are gonna be doing a really big giveaway of a Diamondback 10 foot, 10 inch, six weight fly rod, the exact rod that I use for my steelhead fishing, we are giving away. So I hope you guys will subscribe and follow us for all of that. And if you guys wanna geek out on how detailed Joe Goodspeed gets on the design of his rods, 
The Fly Fish Vu guys just released a podcast with Joe and it's really pretty phenomenal. I'm gonna link that down below. Check that out when you get a chance. And we have so much more coming in this urine and series for Steelhead. So please leave your comments down below. I promise I will read every single one. I wanna know what you guys wanna see. So Steelhead season is upon us. The fish are coming in. I hope you guys have a great season and we will see you soon for the rest of our series.